Trail runners, welcome to Chasing Gold, where we are chatting with some of the top runners coming to the Javelina 100 mile, trying to get themselves one of the two coveted golden tickets to Western States 2023. Today on this show, we welcome Brianna Grigsby. Brianna runs with the Araviper Racing Team. She is sponsors with Koros, Goo, Rabbit, and Squirrels Nut Butter. She is very familiar with racing in the desert. She has a fifth at Black Canyon 100K this past year, a fifth at Bandera, two, two golden ticket races where she almost got in. She has been on the Javelina course, running the 100 mile in 2019 for eighth place, and last year, the 100K second place. Brianna is also coming off the course. She ran the Javelina Hangover 50K one month ago, won that race. Brianna, welcome to the show. Thank you for having me on. It's great to be here, and I'm super excited to be out at Javelina this year. Oh, thank you for coming on. Let's talk about you and the course and your path to a golden ticket. Last year, whew, Black Canyon, five minutes away from that ticket. What kind of yeah. things? What kind of things has been going on in your head since that time? Thinking of how could I have shaved those five minutes off? <laughs> Well, you know, I was like super excited with how well the race went that day. I had no clue that I was in fifth place actually until I got to Table Mesa and someone told me and I was just like, no way. You know, I knew mm. I, I pretty much I was in the top 10, but I didn't know that I was fifth. And they told me that fourth wasn't that far ahead of me. And of course, at this point, I did not know that Claire wasn't going to take the golden ticket. <laughs> so I thought I needed to move up, you know, a couple of places. But uh, I was pretty stoked to find out where I was at. Um, of course, I did not end up catching Taylor Nolan. Uh, but I was super close, as you mentioned. Um, I think I really put it all out there that day. I feel like I had a great day. I gave it the best that I had in me. Um, and it was one of those days where I actually, I think I might've told Bryce who was pacing me, uh, I feel like I could run a hundred miles today. <laughs> it was just a really great day. So I'm hoping I have a day like that at Javelina. But um, yeah, you know, I think I was really happy with my performance and it gave me a lot of confidence seeing how close I was to getting a golden ticket. Uh, but at the same time, of course, you have you do have those thoughts of, oh, five minutes and figuring up how many seconds per mile you needed to shave. And oh, oh yeah. I, if I had known that I was that close, could I have pulled it off? But I think that's an answer or a question that I will never necessarily know the answer to. So um, I'm just going to live with it how it is and keep trying. Absolutely. And a fifth at Bandera, which was just, I don't know, six weeks or so before that event. Again, a very, a very close, close race. Um, and I think we've seen, you know, over the years, right? It's like athletes, right? They get so close to these tickets or so close to that breakout performance. We know that that breakout performance is coming. It's just a matter of time. And personally, I mean, I think that that time is is now for you here at Javelina. You know the course. You've been on it. You've been on it multiple times, on it recently, winning a 50K. Is this the style of course you think that plays to your strengths? It's a runnable course, a little rolly. While it is kind of a flat course, there's not much flat sections on the course. It's almost always like this very gradual 1% or 2%. Do you think this course sets up well for you to, uh, for a chance for you to get that ticket? Yeah, I think this course does play to my strengths. Uh, for one thing, we're in the desert. I live in Tucson in the desert. I'm used to running in the heat. Uh, pretty much for me, the hotter, the better. Uh, hangover 50K, it was 97 degrees when we started that. 
Um, and I never felt hot the whole time. So for me, you know, the hotter the day, the better it's going to be in terms of giving me every little advantage I can get out there. Um, I do well with nutrition in the heat. And um, so I think that definitely plays to my strengths. And then in terms of the course profile, I most of the races that I've run have been on runnable courses. I haven't done a ton of verdy mountainous races, which, you know, as a side note, that's something I'd like to explore eventually. But I do think that uh, I tend to do well in runnable races. Um, Black Canyon, Havelina 100K last year. Um, so, yeah, I, I think it'll be a good race for me. Sure. And if we look, if we look, you know, 2019, you came out, you ran the 100 mile, 19 and a half hours, eighth place. Very, very solid performance. Came back last year for the 100K and got second place. Another stout performance. What things have you learned from those two events on the course that you're going to take with you in your strategy piece on race day? Like, how does race day look for you um, in terms of the cooling and the strategy, uh, fueling, all that stuff? Um, so going back to the 100 mile in 2019, I think what I really learned from that race was how to pace 100 milers. Mm -hmm. um, so my first 100 miler was at Rio del Lago, which is also a pretty runnable course, but I went out uh, way too fast, ended up burning myself out and walking the last 30 miles, went from second place down to eighth place at that race. Um, and then when I ran in 2019, my friend Mandy Holmes, who will be pacing me this year, uh, she was out there running the race as well. And she is like really great at pacing 100 milers. So I said, hey, I'm just going to I'm just going to run with you. <laughs> and we had the first 50 miles of the race together. It was way more of a conservative start than I would have done on my own. Uh, but what I ended up doing was running the last 10 miles of the race as my fastest 10 miles of the whole race. So that's when you know that, you know, you, you did a pretty good job with the pacing when you can pull that out at the end. Um, so I think that was the big lesson from 2019. And then I think the big lesson that I pulled out of last year at the 100K uh, was how to handle nutrition in the heat and more of a reliance on liquid calories. Um, I ended up doing that thing that you're never supposed to do during a race, try something new on race day, which was goo roctane drink mix, which happened to be at the aid stations. And it worked so well for me because at that point I wasn't really wanting to take in even like gels uh, or any food. And I found that I was able to get through the entire 100K pretty much relying almost solely on liquid nutrition. Uh, and it worked really, really well. So since then, I've been a big fan of Goo Roctane. Um, and I will definitely be using that this year. Nice. Yeah, Mandy had mentioned uh, she has plenty of Austin Powers comedy for you and any uh, upcoming pacing duties that she has. Uh, before, in your past, you had... Um, you know, you've recently switched to Goo Roctane as a beverage, but it seems like in the past you were more making your own type of juices, watermelon juice, celery juice. Um, so how is that fueling, like as, uh, as an athlete, as a healthy human, how do you kind of separate those two? A lot of athletes struggle with that where they're trying to lead the – healthy diet, you know, 24, 365, but then they get to these race uh, scenarios and maybe that fueling strategy isn't the best on race day. Um, so how did you make that transition to kind of leaving that stuff behind and moving more towards an engineered product? Yeah. Um, well, I will say I still love celery cucumber juice because it tastes really salty and bitter and that is you know what i often crave in the heat so that's definitely going to be out there probably more like finish line what i'm drinking um but the the downside of that is that it doesn't have very many calories uh the goo octane has about 250 calories per serving which is you know a really really good amount of calories to be taking in um but yeah, I think I used to have a lot more kind of, I guess you might call them rules around food and trying to eat more unprocessed whole foods. And of course I do 
really like to incorporate that in my diet, but I've found that when I'm racing, um, it's more beneficial for me to make sure that I'm getting in the amount of calories that I need and doing that, you know, with less fiber and things that could upset the GI system. Um, so I think when you're running a race like this, anyhow, you know, your body is just burning through all that sugar and calories and fuel that you're taking in. Um, so the most important thing is making sure that you're, that you're getting enough calories, enough carbs, um, to be able to fuel the effort that you're doing. Sure. And there is a little, a little saying in our sport of, and within the coaches, right? Where sometimes the, the mainstream idea would be, let's get fluids in the bottles and fuel from the pocket, meaning, Hey, if your if your bottles are so calorically dense and it's a really hot day like Javelina, some could argue it's challenging to find that balance, right? Like you said, if you have 250 calories per bottle, it's a hot day. You're going through, you know, you might need over a liter per hour of fluids just to stay hydrated. How does that look for you? Do you have like one bottle where you have this this high energy drink, and then one bottle with fluids, or is it all just the Guru Octane? Um, pretty much for me, it's just the goo roctane. Um, and if I'm drinking a liter an hour, 500 calories an hour, Hey, I'm doing a great job on my fueling and my GI system tends to handle that pretty well. Um, because I'm used to doing that on my training runs. So, um, I, what I found for me and everybody's a little bit different with the amount of salt that they're losing out there. But if I'm drinking too much plain water, then I'm going to end up hyponatremic unless I'm taking salt caps with it. So um, sometimes I will drink a bottle or two of plain water just because I want the taste of just straight up water that's not sweet. Uh, but when I do that, I typically have to take salt caps with it. Sure, sure. Yeah, the last few years, Bree, we've seen like a big upward trajectory in your results. Um, you know, you had been doing well at the beginning of your career and that is just going up and up. And now it has lent you to the spot where you are in that position to get a golden ticket. So what things have you been doing in the past, say, two or three years that have helped you grow to the athlete you are today? So uh, when I started running ultras back in 2016, I was just finishing medical school and starting residency. So the first year of residency was pretty intense with working 80 or more hours per week in the hospital. Um, and at that point, you know, I was racing ultras when I happened to have a day off, but a lot of the time my training looked like me going for a long run on my one day off in seven, uh, and then not really doing much running the rest of the week. So there wasn't a whole lot of consistency there. Um, in my second year of residency in 2017, I started working with my coach, Megan Roach. Um, I had a little bit more time at that point and um, really started to see improvements with uh, more consistency and also starting to do speed work, which I never used to do before uh, when Megan was started designing my training plan for me. Uh, and then in 2019, I graduated from residency. And since then, I have been working part time, which allows me to have a whole lot more time to train. So there's just been, you know, years of consistency starting in 2017. And, you know, back at the beginning of racing ultras, I didn't have that kind of consistency. So I would say that that's the big factor. Sure. Yeah, it's one of those things where athletes, a lot of athletes will overestimate what they can do in a year and underestimate what they can do in three years. And it's one of those things that just consistency and fitness, right? It just fitness builds on fitness. So you have one good cycle, the next cycle you build. And it is, it's, it's great to see when, when all those blocks add up on top of each other and you get to the point where you're at now, one of the, one of the best athletes in our sport. Um, all right, so if we look at Javelina, you said you do have crew, you do have pacing coming out. What is like some of the mental things you're telling yourself? You know it's a five-loop race. You know maybe you've learned how to pace now this 100-mile section. But you also know that like the first 10-ish miles are slightly uphill. The last 10 are slightly downhill. And of course, there's ups and downs on both sections. But the, the primary is uphill, then downhill. 
Are you using like any any mantras or anything to remind yourself like, hey, I need to take it easy on the first two laps or three laps, or hey, I, I need to take it easy on the on this first descent because there is a lot of excitement out there. So are you someone that has like some mantras in your head that you're using on each, each lap or, or how do you stay composed on race day? Um, I think one of the things is just trying to focus on myself and my own race instead of worrying about what other people are doing. Um, you know, that really helped at Black Canyon this year, where which is another race where people typically go out really way too fast, uh, especially if they're not familiar with the course. So I think just like getting out of my uh, mentality of worrying about what other people are doing and just thinking about myself and what I need to do for my best performance uh, is going to be key. I'm planning to try to take the uphills extra easy so that I can have a little bit more to give on the downhill part of the loop. And of course, you know, in that first loop, it doesn't even really feel like you're going uphill when you're fresh, mm -hmm. but then by by the fourth or fifth loop, you're like, what is this mountain I'm climbing? When did I get to the top of it? Um, so I think, yeah, just like saving, conserving effort in the beginning, saving for later on, while at the same time, you know, also taking advantage of the fact that it's cooler in the morning without, you know, overdoing it. Uh, I think having run Cocodona, <laughs> uh, one of the helpful things that I think to myself a lot is, hey, I've been in a lot worse pain than this before, so... <laughs> I can handle this, you know, it's, it's not supposed to be comfortable the whole time. That's not, we wouldn't run ultras if it was easy, right? Absolutely. And if we, if we think about pacing strategy on race day, do you think, is your plan going out? Obviously everyone has, has goals and plans, but do you think you can execute, like, is the plan to go for five evenly paced laps, you know, in a perfect scenario? Are you trying to start a little more conservative that the last laps are actually faster than the first laps? Or are you saying, hey, it's a little cooler at the start of the day. I'm going to try to get out a little quicker than what my middle laps could look like. Like, what is that strategy in terms of effort and pacing? How are you, how are you juggling that? Yeah, I think, you know, if I can make the last lap be my fastest, that would be a huge success. Although I will say I'm not as great at the negative splitting compared to Nick Curry. But, uh, you know, I, I I did run the last 10 miles of Havelina 100 in 2019 as my fastest 10. So if I could do that again this year, that would be awesome. Uh, at the same time, I do want to kind of take advantage of the first loop when it's cooler without taking too much advantage of it. You know, I don't want to go out too fast. Um, but I, I would say probably the first loop will be a little bit faster than the second and third that are in the heat of the day. And then hopefully picking up the pace again for the fourth and fifth loop. Sounds like a good strategy. I got one more question for you before we dive into the fast paced fart look around. And I am going to put you on the spot here. We know there are a lot of the best women in our sport coming to this event. The times are going to be fast. Have you thought about what sort of time gets you a ticket? Uh, <laughs> yeah. This year is by far, I think, the most competitive we've ever seen out at Hobbling 100. Um, if I had to guess, I would say... Well, for sure, under 16 is going to be the top women, the top female times. Um, can I do that? I don't know. We will find out on Saturday. Um, <laughs> I like it. There's a couple people out there who have been known to run 100 milers and sub 15 as well. So we will see. <laughs> we will see. Saturday is the day. All right. Yeah. We are diving into the 10 question fast paced fart lick round. Bree, are you ready? I'm ready. Question one. What sneakers will you be wearing at the Javelina 100 mile? Hoka Stinson's. It's the only thing I wear, even for work. Woof. We got a believer in the Stinson. All right. Javelina is known for its Halloween weekend, its Halloween themes, its costumes. Can you tell us what is your most memorable Halloween costume growing up? Mm, probably the year that I was like a stuffed pumpkin where I had this 
pumpkin suit that was stuffed full of newspapers. Uh, <laughs> I was probably like four or five years old. Perfect. All right. How about one product you wish were at every aid station at every single race that you ever go to? What one product would you choose to be at those race stations? Goo Roctane drink mix. Perfect. You're on, a, you're on a training run on the trail. Someone's running towards you. Are you most likely to say, hey, hi, or howdy? Uh, probably hello or good morning. Even if it's the afternoon, I say good morning because <laughs> I did not still the morning. <laughs> Perfect. Tough one here. Where do you stand with candy corn? Yay or nay? No, it's not chocolate. It's got to be dark chocolate. Okay. What about race breakfast? What are we going with? Uh, I'm not someone who has a consistent, like, the same race breakfast every time, but I'm thinking probably for Javelina, it might be pancakes because that's been mm. going well before my long runs recently. Nice. I like that strategy. Favorite Halloween candy? Uh, none of the traditional stuff. I would say it's got to be dark chocolate, and ideally, if it has peanut butter, uh, mm. that's even dark chocolate and peanut butter. Match made in heaven. Absolutely. I remember a time uh, I had some trick or treaters at my door, and I ran out of candy, and only had seventy percent big dark chocolate bars. And those four children probably got home for a surprise that they did not want. I want to come to your house if you're giving those out. <laughs> All right, walkout song. You got to choose the song you walk out to onto the Javelina course. What song are you going with? Probably Business by Eminem. <laughs> nice. <laughs> Here's the question everyone wants to know regarding the golden ticket. Are you Team Gene Wilder or Team Johnny Depp? Probably Johnny Depp. <sighs> Breaks my heart. Last question, putting you on the spot once again. Bree, what place are you finishing the Javelina 100 mile this Saturday? I don't know. We're oh. going to find out. Uh, you okay. know I can't let you off that easy. <laughs> <laughs> All right. Golden ticket, so I want to be in the top two, right? All right. Yeah, we're only, in we're only interviewing golden. Yeah, we're only interviewing golden ticket candidates, so we got you in the top two, Bree. All right, sounds good. Thank you for coming on. We will see you this weekend at Havelina. Awesome. Looking forward to it.